Uh, hopefully everyone can hear me pretty well. Um, as Bruce just said, my name's Mark. If I've met you before, I'm a PhD student here at UWA. Um, I do quite a bit of different work, but today I'm going to be mainly talking about some work we've done with uh, hydrate formation likelihood and kind of the next steps in terms of building this towards a field scale. So a few times before, I've spoken about how we might do parts of this, but this is all sort of bringing it all together. So what we're thinking about here is a process called hydrate nucleation. Now, some of you might know what that is, some of you might not, but essentially what that means is the time to form hydrate is random. So we know that hydrate formation itself is stochastic. The reason why it's called stochastic is it means it's random, but we can use probability distributions to describe, for example, how often it might take to form. We've got a picture here, which is from Walsh et al. And these are molecular dynamics simulations where we're seeing a hydrate nucleus, which is being built from a whole lot of monomers. And we can see here is we start with a system that's very random and dispersed. And then we ended up with this really ordered structured system at the end there. And even if it's uh, thermodynamically stable for a hydrate to form, it'll take time to organize all the molecules into that arrangement. And that's why we see a, a delay time or an induction time in experiments. We know we have this problem, but the issue is we actually don't know how to deal with this quantitatively. So there are lots of kind of industrial heuristics and things like that. Things you might have heard before is something like if the subcooling is less than 3.6 Kelvin, we won't have hydrate formation. That dipping into the equilibrium region is safe, or that KHIs give us 10 hours of hydrate pre production at subcooling less than 10 Kelvin. So these are a qualitative statements, but what we want to look at now is where do these actually come from? So to do this, we're trying to develop a hydrate nucleation model, um, and essentially we're translating our rules of thumb into actual quantitative mathematics. So in our nucleation model, what we will normally get out is something that looks like this. So we have the formation likelihood on the vertical axis as a function of distance or time. And we can look at different assets or different management strategies, and we might have one that has, say, low, medium, or high formation likelihood. Well, why do we want to do this? It's because it informs both our design and operations. So in terms of design, it lets us look at risk and cost based optimization. For example, if we have a tiny probability of hydrate formation in our system, we might not actually need to dose any inhibitors. We can also look at things like optimizing our THI dosages and if we need to use an alternative management strategy. In terms of our operations, it can also affect things like water breakthrough. So so it can be affected by things like water breakthrough. So if all of a sudden more water starts coming in our system and we don't have more THI dosage capacity, will we actually have a hydrate problem? It also informs our start up and shutdown practices and remediation because we can start to look at predicting where in the system the hydrate plugs will form. So this sounds great in theory, and I wish it was this simple, but unfortunately in reality, this is quite challenging to do. And the primary reason for this is that nucleation is really a microscopic phenomenon. So we're talking about times to form a critical nucleus, which is on the order of, say, tens of molecules. So if you look here, this might be our critical nucleus. And you can see the gas molecules here in the circles and the water molecules in the red. But we've only, say, got tens or more hundreds of molecules here. But what we know in reality, if we're lucky, are measured macroscopic properties. So these are many, many orders of magnitude higher numbers of molecules. So say greater than 23 orders of magnitude higher. If we're lucky, we'll know the pressure and temperature for every section of our pipeline. We often don't know that, so we need to use a flow line simulator as a uh, interpretive tool. So really what our nucleation model actually needs to do is resolve these differences in scale. So how do we go from having macroscopic properties to understanding how microscopic phenomena play out. One way we can do this is we can measure uh, experimentally some different uh, things that characterize the hydrate formation process. So what we tend to measure is something called the nucleation rate. Now that's a pretty easy concept to understand. It's our hydrate formation rate per unit time, or the inverse of the nucleation rate is the average time to form. So when we're doing these measurements, we're at the lab scale. So we're definitely much further to the right in terms of this continuum, but we're closer to a little bit closer to the microscopic scale than we are in, say, a massive system. Not much closer, though. Um, and what we can do is we can start to look at how uh, the nucleation rate changes between these different scales. And to do that, we need to use theory, unfortunately. You won't get away with this presentation without theory. Um, and there'll be a couple of equations here, but it's not important to understand the details of it. It's more that nucleation theory gives us a bridge between these two scales. 
So this equation up here is the classical nucleation theory equation for the nucleation rate, which is our J parameter here. And the interesting thing here is we have two different scales in this equation. So the subcooling and the temperature are macroscopic properties, where this A and B prime parameter are actually microscopic properties, which say things about the nucleation process itself. Now, we've done a lot of work with this equation. I'm, I'm sure a few of you have seen it a few times before, but we're pretty confident in using it as an interpretive framework. So the next step is to move towards using it as a predictive framework. So when we do this, essentially what we try and do is measure different system sizes and types of interfaces in the lab and see uh, what information we can get out. So we have a few different systems here, the, the HPS altar, and the newly developed pipe altar system, which Cheng Long will talk about in the next talk. We also have the acoustic levitator and the cryoscope. So the cryoscope lets us look more at hydrates that form, say, during natural gas liquefaction at much lower concentrations. So all of the learnings from these apparatuses can really be summarized in a few points. So what we know is that the nucleation rate can change with time, subcooling, the identity of our hydrate former, the interfacial properties of our system, the amount of mixing and how large our system is, and if we have any additives present in the system. And really what the goal of our model is, is to capture all of these dependencies. So now I'm gonna run you through a bit of background on how the model itself actually works. Now, traditionally, when you're doing a flow line simulation or something like that, you would take something called an Eulerian approach. And what this means is we take our system, which is this gray rectangle here, that's to represent a pipeline, and we split it up into a set of control volumes. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna assume that the properties are constant in each of those control volumes. For probability-based simulations, though, this is challenging. And that's because there's lots of different formation probabilities that you need to keep track of. So for the nth control volume in our system, we actually need to understand three different formation probabilities. The first one is, what is, it forms, what is the probability that it forms in this section? The second one is, what's the probability that it's formed up to this section? These are actually linked to each other, but interestingly, this depends on the probability throughout our entire system. So we need to know the history of our fluid going through our system here. And finally, this is only for the first bit of fluid going through our system. What happens when we start extending to, say, production over a week, a month, or a year? We also need to know the probability of formation after, say, the ith fluid packet has passed. So keeping a track of all of these and, and mapping them to control volumes is quite challenging. So an alternative we can do is to actually just track the fluid packet. And this is called taking a Lagrangian approach. I'm going to step you through how that works now. So it's pretty straightforward. Instead of our uh, control volume being fixed in space, it's now we're just following a fixed control volume of fluid here along our system. Now, what this fluid packet is depends on the flow regime. We haven't done a whole lot of work in this area. We're kind of restricted to only simple examples for now. But what we think this comes down to is thinking about which components in excess. So for example, if we are say a water bubble in gas dominant flow, we're gonna use that as our control volume because, sorry, as our fluid packet, because the water is the limiting uh, phase. Um, we might do the opposite, for example, if we're in bubbly flow, we track some gas bubbles going down our pipeline. I'm gonna focus mainly on the second one here today. And that's because we've been doing some previous uh, simulation work with bubbly flow. But what we're gonna define our fluid packet is, is as the number of moles of gas we produce in one second. And it's important to use a number of moles because then we can vary the interfacial area as we go down our system. Um, and for now we're restricted to steady state. That's not a limitation of the method, it's more just in terms of keeping it relatively simple for now. So essentially when we go from a Eulerian to a Lagrangian approach, any length dependencies in our system become time dependencies. So for example, if the system has a variable subcooling along its length, the fluid packet will experience a variable subcooling as a function of time. And these are linked to each other pretty straightforwardly through the fluid velocity. So to give you an idea of how this works, say we've got this simple system here. We've got two control volumes, which are 10 meters long, each with two subcoolings. Now, if we know the fluid velocity here, we can convert these length dependencies to time dependencies. So when our packet actually travels through this system from left to right, for the first second, it will experience a subcooling of uh, two Kelvin, and then for the second second, it would experience a subcooling of five Kelvin. So it's pretty easy to swap between these two reference frames. 
One thing to note here, though, is that we still need to discretize the actual geometry of the system. And the reason why we need to do this is because we need to assume flow properties are constant in each section to calculate the nucleation rate. All right, now onto the nucleation rate itself. So we've split our system up into a whole lot of control volumes. How do we actually calculate J for all of those different control volumes? So we're going to have a few different uh, outputs from both our simulation and experiment. So our simulation is probably going to give us a profile of how the subcooling and temperature changes along our pipeline. So we can go ahead and plug subcooling and temperature into this equation here. Now we also know delta S he here and KB because these are just constants. Now experimental apparatus, what we do is we look at how J changes with subcooling and that tells us information about B prime and A. So we can take A and B prime from our apparatus and also plug it into this equation. Now they might say, I've actually left something on here which I haven't talked about, which is the interfacial area. Now normally we would get this from a flow correlation or something similar. The question is, well, where is it in this equation? Um, I don't want to ask anyone because I talked about this last time, but basically this comes into this A parameter. So A is essentially equal to the number of nucleation sites, and that means it's proportional to the interfacial area of the interface which, on which nucleation is occurring. So really what we actually are doing here is we're taking our A from an experimental apparatus, we're multiplying it by the interfacial area difference and plugging it into this equation here. So now I can fill this in for our entire geometry. And for example, the subcooling temperature and interfacial area in each section becomes the nucleation rate in each section. Now I've got a little bit more uh, maths to come, but hopefully not too much. So in general, it's pretty simple mathematically to calculate the formation probability if you know how J changes. So this is our nucleation rate as a function of time here, and this is what we're really trying to model. All we have to do is plug it into this exponential equation to get out the formation probability, F of T. You notice we're using T here because we're talking about uh, Lagrangian approach, so in terms of time along our system. Now the advantage of discretizing our geometry is that we can swap this integral out for a sum. So essentially this complex integral just becomes a sum of all the nucleation rates in each section multiplied by the resonance time in each section. Now one interesting thing about this approach is that f of t here is actually defined by definition as the formation probability for a single fluid packet going through our system. That's important to keep in mind and we're going to come back to that later. Before we do that, I'm going to give you a quick example of um, how this all works together when you don't have a KHI present in your system. We're going to assume that we have a 50 kilometer long tieback, a reservoir that's forming structure to hydrate, and we're operating in a bubbly flow regime with quite a low velocity. Uh, the specifics of this aren't meant to be representative of a real field. It's just to give you an idea of, of what we can do. We're also going to assume that there's 100% more interfacial area in each control volume than what we measure in our experiment. So essentially that's our scaling factor for the nucleation rate. We're also going to quite simply assume that the subcooling increases linearly with length. So that might look something like here. At the start of our tieback, we've got zero subcooling, and at the end we're going up to three Kelvin subcooling. So if we take all of that information I just talked about, plug it into the equations, this is what we get out that looks like this. So here we're looking at the formation probability as a function of length, and you can see that at the end of our system, the probability of formation is 0.025%. I've called this F1 here, and this is to remind us that F1 is the probability for the first fluid packet going through our system. In reality, we don't just have a single fluid packet going through our system. We keep producing continuously for a certain length of time. So the question now becomes, well, how many fluid packets am I producing in, say, a day, a week, a month, or a year? That way we can start to look at continuous production. So we're going to make a slightly complex definition here, but we're going to define P of Tn, which is the probability of formation after producing n packets. So in our previous example, the residence time is actually quite long. It's about 34 hours. So roughly speaking, that is the formation probability, F1, of forming in a single day because our residence time is essentially the same length as, as a day. We need to multiply that roughly by seven to talk about our formation probability in a week. 
In terms of working this out, we can just use probability theory. And the observation here is essentially that formation could occur in any of the n packets that travel through our system. So all we need to actually do is work out the formation probability of no formation, do one minus that, and we'll get formation probability back out. So that, and then it doesn't matter if it's formed in one packet, in two, or in three. Um, and the math just becomes a little bit more complex, but it's pretty simple. So we take our formation probability from the first packet and we raise it to the power of n, plug it into this equation, and we get the formation probability after producing n packets. Now that's all packets and formation probabilities, probably what you actually care about and what this looks like, something like this. So now this is our total formation probability as a function of length. And now we're looking at different time scales. So when we produce the first packet, we have a low formation probability of about 0.01%. And this starts to increase if we produce continuously for a week, a month, and a year. And so if we produce that system constantly for a year, we would end up with a formation probability of about 5%. I should have said before, this is a uh, log scale on the vertical axis here. So these are quite different time dependencies. All right, so we've looked at that for a relatively simple example. What happens if we start playing around with some of the parameters? So if we increase the maximum subcooling experienced by our system to either 3.64 or 5 Kelvin, we see the formation probability starts to increase. But the interesting thing here is that these formation probabilities are basically those F1 values I talked about before. So now we have a 2% formation probability in the first packet if the maximum subcooling is 3.6 Kelvin. Before, when the maximum subcooling was 3 Kelvin, we had a 0.0125% formation probability. So you can see that it's very dependent on the subcooling. If we increase the subcooling by a little bit, we start looking at orders of magnitude difference in formation probability. I will note uh, briefly that these numbers are conservative. So in our experimental apparatus, we're measuring under continuous 700 RPM shear, uh, and we think that eliminates most of the mass transfer limitations from our system. Now in a real system, that might not be true. We might not have perfect mixing. And so this is likely to be an upper bound on the formation probability. We've also still got a bit of work to do with size scaling and things like that, but this is an idea of essentially where it's going to. Now the next question, which I've been working for quite a while on uh, now is, well, what happens when we start putting the KHI in our system? And what does that affect? Now we're gonna look at an example for a kinetic inhibitor. Uh, and although I wish it was simple, it's uh, unfortunately needs a little bit more maths. So as a reminder, this is the equation we're using to calculate our formation probability for the first packet going through our system. This J of T here, which is a time dependent nucleation rate, comes because when the packet goes through the system, it experiences different conditions as a function of time. Now for a KHI, that's not true. With a KHI, your nucleation rate changes as a function of time, even if you hold the system conditions constant. So there's an additional time dependency we have to account for. And basically, we end up with another factor in our equation. So to, to show this more directly, in the HPS alter, we've measured the nucleation rate as a function of time, and you can see that it's increasing here on a log axis. So if the KHI wasn't present in our system, we would expect to see a flat line here. And that's indeed actually what we see. So the question is, well, I've got constant subcooling, constant interfacial area. It's measured in the same system, but the J is changing as a function of time. Why is that happening? And the conceptual model we've worked about, uh, worked on so far is mainly about hydrate clusters. So when we're building our hydrate nucleus, we first start with a set of monomers. So these are all just single molecules, essentially floating around in space. Now, over time, when hydrate formation becomes thermodynamically stable, the monomers will start aggregating together. And so we'll start to get groups of monomers. And groups of monomers are called clusters. And then each of these clusters will have some sort of random absorption and desorption of a monomer, but eventually we'll get to some sort of steady state here. And this is called the equilibrium cluster size distribution. So we'll have a spread of sizes for our system. Now this is important because in each of these steps, the nucleation rate is different. And the easiest way to think about this is Say my critical nucleus uh, is built from 10 monomers. Well, it's a lot easier to build a 10 monomer nucleus from this step than it is from here. So this means that the chance of 10 mon monomers randomly grouping together in the first stage is extremely low. So our nucleation rate essentially increases until we get to this step. 
Now, what we think happens is that the KHI interferes with the establishment of this equilibrium cluster size distribution. It comes in, it attaches to the hydrate surface, and it stops more monomers from attaching to the cluster. So basically, what this uh, means, I've already spoken about that point a little bit, is that we need to add another term which characterizes this process to our expression for the nucleation rate. So we end up with something that looks like this. This is our equation from before on the left hand side here. And this tells us about how J changes because the system conditions are changing. We now have a second term here which expresses how the KHI changes the nucleation rate. Now this term is always less than or equal to one. So it always slows the nucleation rate. Now the fortunate thing uh, here is that we can get these constants C1 and C2 out of experimental measurements. Now we haven't done this vigorously yet and we don't know if these constants change with say system size, but I'm give you, gonna give you an idea of, of how this can affect uh, the system. Now we're gonna look at a slightly different example, which is let's assume we're producing gas from a methane hydrate reservoir. We've got a flow line length of just under two kilometers and a fluid velocity of one meter per second. Now, for simplicity, we're going to assume a constant subcooling of 2 Kelvin. That means that the nucleation rate, if we didn't have a KHI, wouldn't change as a function of length, but it will change here because we do have a KHI. We're also going to dose one weight percent KHI because that's what we've got the most measurements for. All right, so we get out a plot that looks something like this. On the vertical axis here, we're again looking at a log scale formation probability as a function of length. So this red curve here is what happens if we don't put the KHI in our system. And essentially, we have a 100% formation probability within about 0.1 kilometers in the first packet. Uh, second, we add a KHI into our system down here, and we get a very low formation probability. And it actually translates to only a 50% formation probability in the first two weeks. As a reminder here, our residence time is only 30 minutes. So that's quite a lot of packets going through our system. The reason why this formation probability is so high is because methane hydrate forms much faster than a structure two hydrate. So a subcooling of two Kelvin is actually quite high for methane. Now really what we want to do next here is we want to start looking at how bad would it actually be if it forms. So, so far we've talked about the formation likelihood, but that doesn't tell us how bad the problem is going to be. And really what we need to look at next is the intrinsic, intrinsic coupling of nucleation and growth. So, the question you might ask is, okay, we've got these outputs from our, our nucleation simulation. We know where it's likely to form, but what is actually the worst possible place it can form? Now, if you were looking at this straight away, you might go, oh, okay, it would be pretty bad if it formed here because the subcooling is high, which means the growth rate will be high. But the answer, somewhat intuitively, is actually the worst place it can form is at the start of the flow line. Because if it forms here, we can then grow over the entirety of this system length. So this tells us essentially that formation likelihood predictions are only are useful to an extent with our growth rates. So to give you an idea of how this all works together, we come back to our classic equation for risk. We've been focusing mainly on this likelihood side of the equation, which we've got here. We think this functional form works relatively well. We've still got a bit of work to do in making sure all the parameters scale how we want it to do. But what we want to start looking at next is let's start coupling in a severity. And now that depends on two different things, both our growth rate under our system conditions, but also how long we're exposed to the hydrate equilibrium region for. Thank you very much. I think that was a bit of a whirlwind talk, but that's what we've been working on so far. I'm happy to take any questions.